Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. From nearly all of the windows of the house, I can look out across the plain with no obstacle in the shape of a hill right away to a blue line of distant forest and on the west side uninterruptedly to the setting sun nothing but a green rolling plain with a sharp edge against the sunset. I love those west windows better than any others and have chosen my bedroom on that side of the house so that even times of hair brushing may not be entirely lost. And the young woman who attends to such matters has been taught to fulfil her duties about a mistress recumbent in an easy chair before an open window and not to profane with chatter that sweet and solemn time. This girl is grieved at my habit of living almost in a garden, and all her ideas as to the sort of life of a respectable German lady should lead have got into a sad muddle since she came to me. The people round about are persuaded that I am, to put it as kindly as possible, exceedingly eccentric for the news that has travelled that I spend the day out of doors with a book and that no mortal eye has ever seen me sew or cook. But why cook when you can get someone to cook for you? And as for sewing... The maids will hem the sheets better and quicker than I could, and all forms of needlework of the fancy order are inventions of the evil one for keeping the foolish from applying their heart to wisdom. We had been married five years before it struck us that we might as well make use of this place by coming down and living in it. Those five years were spent in a flat in a town, and during their whole interminable length I was perfectly miserable and perfectly healthy, which disposes of the ugly notion that has at times disturbed me that my happiness here is less due to the garden than to a good digestion. And while we were here, wasting our lives there, here was this dear place with dandelions up to the very door. All the paths, grass grown and completely effaced. In winter, so lonely with nobody but the north wind, taking the least notice of it. And in May, in all of those five lovely Mays, no one to look at the wonderful bird cherries and still more wonderful masses of lilacs, everything glowing and blowing, the Virginia creeper, madder every year, until at last, in October, the very roof was wreathed with a blood-red tresses, the owls and the squirrels, and all the blessed little birds reigning supreme and not a living creature ever entering the empty house except the snakes which got into the habit during those silent years of wriggling up the south wall into the rooms on that side whenever the old housekeeper opened the windows and that was here peace and happiness and a reasonable life and yet it never struck me to come and live in it looking back i am astonished and can in no way account for the tardiness of my discovery that here 
in this faraway corner was my kingdom of heaven. Indeed, so little did it enter my head to even use the place in summer, that I submitted to weeks of seaside life with all of its horrors every year, until at last, in the early spring of last year, having come down for the opening of the village school, and wandering out afterwards into the bare and desolate garden, I don't know what smell of wet earth or rotting leaves brought back my childhood with a rush, and all the happy days I had spent in a garden. Shall I ever forget that day? It was the beginning of my real life, my coming of age, as it were, and entering into my kingdom. Early March, grey, quiet skies and brown, quiet earth, leafless and sad and lonely enough, out there in the dump and silence. Yet there I stood feeling the same rapture of pure delight in the first breath of spring that I used to as a child, and the five wasted years fell from me like a cloak, and the world was full of hope and I vowed myself then and there to nature, and have been happy ever since. My other half being indulgence, and with some faint thought perhaps that it might as well to look after this base, consented to live in it at any rate for a time, whereupon followed by six specially blissful weeks, from the end of April to June, during which I was there alone, supposed to be superintending the painting and papering, but as a matter of fact, only going into the house when the workmen had gone out of it. How happy I was. I don't remember any time so perfect since the days when I was too little to do lessons and turned out with sugar on my eleven o'clock bread and butter onto a lawn closely strewn with dandelions and daisies. The sugar on the bread and butter has lost its charm, but I love the dandelions and daisies even more passionately now than then and never would endure to see them all mown away if I were not certain that day in a day or two, they would be pushing up their little faces again as jauntily as ever. During those six weeks, I lived in a world of dandelions and delights. The dandelions carpeted the three lawns. They used to be lawns, but have since blossomed out into meadows filled with every sort of pretty weed and under and among the group of leafless oaks and beeches were blue hepatarchus, white anemones, violets and calendines in sheets. The calendines in particular delighted me with their clean, happy brightness, so beautifully trim and newly varnished, as though they too had the painters at work on them. Then when the anemones went, came a few stray periwinkles and Solomon's seal, and all the bird cherries blossomed into a burst. And then, before I had a little got used to the joy of their flowers against the sky, came the lilacs, masses and masses of them in clumps on the grass, with other shrubs and trees by the side of walks, and one great continuous bank of them half a mile long right past the west front of the house, away down as far as one could see, shining glorious against a background of firs. When that time came, and when, before it was over, the acacias all blossomed too, and four great clumps of pale silvery pink peonies flowered under the south windows 
I felt so absolutely happy and blessed and thankful and grateful that I really cannot describe it. My days seemed to melt away in a dream of pink and purple peace. There were only the old housekeeper and her handmaiden in the house, so that on the plea of not giving too much trouble I could indulge what my other half calls as fantasy de regle. As regards meals, that is to say meals so simple that they could be brought out onto the lilacs and on a tray. And I lived, I remember, on salad and bread and tea the whole time. Sometimes a very tiny pigeon appearing at lunch to save me, as the old lady thought from starvation. Who but a woman could have stood salad for six weeks, even salad sanctified by the presence and scent of the most glorious lilac masses. I did and grew in grace every day, though I have never liked it since. How often now, oppressed by the necessity of assisting at three dining room meals daily, two of which are conducted by the functionaries held indispensable to a proper maintenance of the family dignity, and all of which are pervaded by joints of meat. How often do I think of my salad days, forty in number, and of the blessedness of being alone as I was then alone. And that is the end of the story, for now. I hope that you enjoyed it to a certain extent, but not enough so that it keeps you awake. You're welcome to listen to one of the other stories, and hopefully fall asleep to one of them. At least get you sleepy and rested. Thank you for listening, and... Keep enjoying the stories for as long as you like.